So today I'm at Memorial Park Cemetery in Battle Creek, Michigan. It's one of the larger ones in the city. It's not the oldest one. It's got some old graves here, but there's also a mix of everything up to present day and it's still very much a large cemetery. So I'm going to try to feature some of the stories here of the people and give you a little bit of the history. So come along and join me. Since I started doing history videos on cemeteries in Battle Creek, I've had a lot of requests to do one at this one. In the past, I've been to Memorial Park before, but this was the first time searching for history. It's a very large cemetery which came into existence some time later than the other cemeteries I've covered on my channel. According to the findagrave.com website, the cemetery is owned and operated as a service to the community by the Kiwanis Club of Battle Creek through the Battle Creek Memorial Park Cemetery Association. It's located between Territorial Road and Columbia Avenue at the intersection of Helmer Road. Needless to say, this is a large cemetery, so it would be impossible to cover every single story in a single video. So consider this selection to be just the beginning. However, I should note these stories could be categorized as incredible. The first stories that we're going to explore are those of Charles and Cecilia Binder. Charles Binder was born on March 22, 1878 in Jackson, Michigan, and came to Battle Creek about a year and a half later with his parents. He was the son of Robert Binder, who had established a meat wholesaling and retail business on South Jefferson Avenue in downtown Battle Creek in 1878. The business eventually grew to one of the largest in the state of Michigan. Upon the death of the elder Robert Binder in 1909, the business was taken over by Charles Binder and his brother, John R. Binder. It was in 1887 that the business was located at 34 East Michigan Avenue in Battle Creek. This is right next door to the present-day Cricket Club in downtown. The Binder's plant there was complete with refrigerator and packing rooms, and at the rear it became a six-story structure. At one time, in addition to the retail store, the Binders had large holdings of farmland in the area. In later years, Charles recalled that he picked out his first chickens for his father's market when he was little more than three years old. In early days, the binder home where he grew up was on Michigan Avenue. He was 16 years old when he began permanently working with his father's market. And when his father passed away, the two brothers divided the responsibility in the firm's operations. After his brother passed away on Thanksgiving morning in 1934, he took over as the sole head of operations. He continued to be active in his business until it was sold in 1955 to the Coldwater Provisioning Company and taken over as Binder Quality Foods. The firm at that point had been in operation by his family over 75 years. A tradition among the friends and associates of Charles Binder was the celebration of his birthday at the market, an event which by long-standing practice was treated as a surprise party. Old friends just happened to be in the store at the proper time when a lighted birthday cake was brought out. Although he was not active in the business at the time, he celebrated his 77th birthday at the store a year before he died. Charles also served as a director of the old National City Bank starting in 1909, succeeding his father, and continued on the board through its various name changes. In 1945, he was elected chairman of the board of the Michigan National Bank in Battle Creek and remained on the board until a year before he passed away. Charles married Cecilia Waters in June of 1903, and after Charles died in 1956, she presented the city with a 618-acre tract of land which became Binder Park. Although she and Charles had never had any children, she was very fond of them and wanted to do something for them. Thus, she donated the park, which as per this article in the year she passed away, it had become a popular place for outdoor activities, including downhill sledding and 
wintertime. When she died in 1963, the Binder Park golf course was nearing completion. A decade later, the city began to introduce plans to establish a zoo in the area, and in 1973, the Binder Park was selected as the location. The zoo made a partial opening on Memorial Day in 1977 and was fully opened by June 2nd that year. So today, Battle Creek has a lot to thank the Binder family for. If Cecilia Binder had not contributed the land to the city, we would not have the golf course, Binder Park, or the Binder Park Zoo. Now the next monument we're gonna visit is that of Major Oscar Wilson Brady. He was born in Ontario, Canada in 1880, the son of Thomas and Mary Brady. He was a veteran of both the Spanish-American War and World War I. A year after his death, the local American Legion post was named in his honor because of his service to the veterans' organizations. While serving in North Dakota for seven years after joining the U.S. Army, on Christmas Day, 1899, he met Marie Holmuth in Kensal, North Dakota and they were married on April 16, 1906 in Stutson County, North Dakota. Together they would have two sons and three daughters. He had been in many campaigns in the Army over his 20 years of service. Although he was a major in retirement, he preferred to be addressed as captain because that was the rank that he held when he served with the 329th Field Artillery at Camp Custer and in France during World War I. He received the rank of major when he was in the reserves after the war when he retired from regular duty in 1919. During his time in the service from private to captain, Major Brady served 12 and a half years in the Philippines during the Philippine insurrection. Later on, an expedition into Mexico with the Field Artillery Unit under General Pershing for seven months fighting Pancho Villa, and later spent two years in Cuba during the Spanish-American War, and then served seven months in France during World War I. A book was published in 1919 on the 329 field artillery, which devoted several pages to the Major, and it described him as, We have always had the profoundest admiration for the man who could handle dignity as though it didn't bother him, and lay it aside on the right occasion. Such a fellow must either be a genius or a royal good fellow. He is both. In his retirement years, he took an active role in veterans' activities. He was often looked at as the marshal of the day for military parades. Once, while leading the parade during the state convention of the United Spanish War Veterans in 1934, Major Brady's horse fell on him after catching a shoe in a streetcar track near McCamley Park on West Michigan Avenue. Although he suffered a fractured ankle and the finish line was several blocks away, Major Brady remounted and led the parade to its end before he was taken to the hospital. He had not ridden a horse since. When he retired, he was the manager of the local farmer's market in Battle Creek. His usual routine in the mornings was to go visit Lewis's Grill and have breakfast, and then go over to open the farmer's market. On the morning of January 27, 1938, he did just that and had breakfast and headed out to his car. He was found in his car about two hours later sitting in front of the restaurant with his lights on. He had died from an apparent heart attack. His wife had found him when he had not shown up to open the farmer's market and she went looking for him. He passed away at the age of 57. More than a thousand people attended his funeral on Sunday, January 30th, 1938, which included an impressive number of veterans and military personnel and friends from civilian life. The church was so crowded, people were packed into the vestibule in the rear of the auditorium, unable to find room at the First Presbyterian Church. More than 325 automobiles formed the funeral procession from the church to the cemetery, an incredible tribute to an honored man. Not far from his grave is a cannon and a flagpole which waves the American flag. At its base is a historic marker which reads, Old Glory. I am the Star Spangled Banner, conceived in 1777 out of love Americans bore for liberty and honor. I am the memorial of the countless heroes who shed their blood to preserve this sacred heritage. I have inspired generations of gallant men who fought against tyranny. 
I am the spirit of Valley Forge, of sacrifice, of courage. I have guarded every rampart where freedom defended its glorious cause. Tripoli, Bellow Wood, Argonne Forest, Omaha Beach, Anzio, Bastogne, Guadalcanal, Coral Sea, Liette Gulf, Iwo Jima, Korea, Vietnam. I fly wherever Americans gave their lives to preserve the sanctity of life. My home is in the hearts of all who feel a thrill of pride when they salute me and what I symbolize. God, country, freedom, valor. At the base of the cannon located next to the flagpole is a plaque that reads, In honor of all departed sisters at Baston Luzon Auxiliary, VFW Post 8715, she served and kept the faith. The Baston Luzon Post was instituted in 1946 with a charter group of 26 women. It was an auxiliary group to the VFW post. Some were wives of military and others were nurses who served. The organization held social gatherings and were involved in ceremonies around the city on Memorial Day and Veterans Day and decorated headstones at the local cemeteries and towns on these holidays. We're next going to visit the monument of George and Carrie Trowbridge. George Trowbridge was born in 1854 in Green Valley, Illinois. He had worked for many years with the railroads in Chicago prior to moving to Washington, D.C. in 1898. Soon thereafter, he was made the IRS agent in charge of the Baltimore, Maryland office. By 1908, he was placed in charge of all IRS agents during the administration of Theodore Roosevelt and later under President Howard Taft. Later on, he took charge of office in Pittsburgh, then Philadelphia, and finally Indianapolis before he returned back to D.C. in 1918. From there, he specialized in tax work until he retired in 1929. He was married to Carrie Cowgill Trowbridge in Wheeling, West Virginia in 1888. She had resided with him in Washington, D.C. for 50 years, mostly while George was chief of the Bureau of Internal Revenue. She'd been born in St. Clairsville, Ohio, in 1858 and was the niece of General George Meade, the famous Civil War general. George Trowbridge died on July 16, 1939. George and Carrie had been members of the Presbyterian Church in Washington, D.C. Carrie Trowbridge died on November 20, 1947 at the Battle Creek Sanitarium where she had been in failing health and receiving treatment for six months. Both she and George were interred at the Abbey mausoleum at Arlington, Virginia. Their bodies were removed to the Memorial Park Cemetery around 2001 in conjunction with the demolition of the mausoleum by the U.S. Department of Defense that year. They had relatives living in Battle Creek. Now let's visit the mausoleum of John Leonard Kellogg, the son of William Keith Kellogg of the W.K. Kellogg Company. He was born on August 23rd, 1883, and grew up in the large family in the Kellogg household in Battle Creek, Michigan. John worked for his father for several years and is responsible for developing a malting process which gave the cornflakes a nut-like flavor. He was also the inventor of all-brand cereal. During this time with the Kellogg Company, which he served a brief period as president, he was responsible for more than 200 patents and trademarks. He was known as Len by many old friends in Battle Creek. He'd started out as a shipping and billing clerk at the Modern Medicine Publishing Company owned by his uncle John Harvey Kellogg before he rose in 20 years to become president of the Kellogg Company. In 1905, he had worked as a chief clerk in the city assessor's office at City Hall and later returned to business college. From 1906 to 1908, he worked in the warehouse of the Sanitas Nut Food Company, even while his father was starting the W.K. Kellogg cereal business which would become internationally known. He began working for his father in 1909. He was president of the Chamber of Commerce in 1917 and 1918 and was instrumental in getting the federal government to establish Camp Custer here in Battle Creek. In the book The Battling Kellogg Brothers by Howard Markell, the author details a rocky relationship between John and his father, which is worth reading if you want to fully understand the family dynamic. John 
John left the Kellogg Company in 1923 and moved to Chicago, buying a paper manufacturing plant and establishing it as the Kellogg Boxboard Company, producing paper cartons and waxed paper products, which he operated for a number of years. In 1933, he received national acclaim and was awarded the Carnegie Medal for Heroism after risking his life to rescue an employee from an acid pool in the plant. Mr. Kellogg was severely burned by the acid and was confined to the hospital for some time after the incident. He'd heard the man's screams and rushed in to save him. His shoes were burned off his feet during the incident as well as part of his clothing and his skin. The employee unfortunately later died of his injuries. In 1940, he established another firm, the John L. Kellogg & Company, which produced instant coffee and other food products. The coffee product was purchased largely by the armed forces during the Second World War. He was married to Hannah Christina Pedersen, and together they had two children. He passed away on April 3, 1950, in Chula Vista, California, following a cerebral hemorrhage while visiting the home of his brother. He'd been residing in Chicago for 25 years before he died. His funeral was held in Chicago and he was buried in Memorial Park Cemetery in this mausoleum. Our final stop in this tour for this video is a well-known author and historian of Battle Creek, Bernice Lowe. Now, if you've been following my channel for a time, you will know that there is no way I could ever do a video at Memorial Park without including her first. So many of the stories I've featured on my channel about aspects of Battle Creek history have been inspired by stories from her famous book, Tales of Battle Creek, which chronicles a diverse mixture of stories from the past. She was born Bernice Jones in Flint, Michigan on October 26, 1896. She taught English at Battle Creek Central High School in 1920 and 1921 before she was married. Mrs. Lowe spent much of her adult life researching the early history of Battle Creek and Calhoun County and its residents, both ordinary and those that went on to world fame, such as serial magnates and Sojourner Truth, the 19th century abolitionist and temperance activist. Her path into local history began in 1951 when she looked out of her living room at Gogwak Lake and began to wonder what had come before her on those shimmering waters. So starting at age 54, the local historian barked on a late life obsession in her unrelenting pursuit of Battle Creek lore. She started with land abstracts on Gogwak Lake and started putting the word out that she was in search of historical leads large and small. She knocked on doors and asked to rummage through people's mementos. Her daughter once said in an interview in the Battle Creek Inquirer in 2010 that she would go to service clubs, community groups, schools, and basically anyone who would listen in search of details of local history. She said her mother was very persistent and would keep after people when she was on the trail of something. She took on the moniker of attic archaeologist after word got around about her sleuthing. She even convinced some families to will her the contents of their attics when they died. Mrs. Lowe's pen name was Bernice Bryant Lowe, with which she received numerous awards for her research and writing, including the Battle Creek Inquirer's 1958 George Award for efforts to make Battle Creek citizens conscious of their rich heritage. She was the author of three books, Hello Michigan, published in 1939, a history book on Michigan history for students at the time, Everyday Play in French and English, published in 1960, and Tales of Battle Creek being her most well-known and her last book published in 1976 on local Battle Creek history. She was also the first author of the popular Looking Back column in the Battle Creek Inquirer, which many of her articles in that paper are treasures for historians today, myself included. She was an active and contributing member of the Battle Creek Historical Society during her lifetime, and a portrait of her was unveiled at the Kim House in 1984 after she died. Her husband was Dr. Stanley Lowe, a longtime physician in 
Battle Creek. He was born in Norfolk, Ohio, and moved to Battle Creek in 1929, where he practiced medicine until 1965. In 1918, he served in World War I for three months as a private and then went to the University of Michigan and graduated with a chemical engineering degree and worked for Kimberly Clark in Appleton, Wisconsin until 1924. He later returned to Ann Arbor in 1928 and graduated from the U of M Medical School. At age 44, he was drafted as a medical doctor into World War II. He was present at the capture of Remingen Bridge in Germany and received the Bronze Star for his work with four other medical officers to save wounded soldiers during an enemy aerial attack. He also saw action at the Battle of the Bulge. According to their daughter, Bernice Bernice Lowe was fond of quoting Sojourner Truth around the house, and she was approached by Robert Miller Sr., publisher of the Enquirer at the time, to write a book about Battle Creek's history for the nation's bicentennial in 1976. So she wrote the book on secondhand stationery, mostly from the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, and she had her husband, a retired physician at the time, to type out the whole 291-page volume. In her acknowledgments in the book, she wrote of him, and my husband, Stanley T. Lowe, whose ability as a critic and cook is only exceeded by his agility as errand boy and two-finger typist. At the age of 80, her crowning achievement as a historian became Tales of Battle Creek. From local parks to the police department, the book is rich in anecdotal history of the city. A 1978 Michigan History Magazine review of the book sums it up most succinctly. Should the serial city of Battle Creek ever have the occasion to list its treasures, let it not only mention cornflakes, and health cures. Bernice Lowe is a city resource, and her sparkling tales of Battle Creek, published during the bicentennial, is evidence. Her book is used even today by historians and writers to double-check facts and more often listen to the voices of the residents from times gone by that jump off the page when you travel through its timeline. So that's going to do it for today's journey through history at Memorial Park here in Battle Creek, Michigan. If you like today's video, please take a minute to hit the like button down there, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you next time.